So, um, welcome. Uh, we are, are very excited to have you here. Um, uh, it's, it's, I know uh, you, you've got an extensive background, which I'm hoping you'll kind of Absolutely. talk about a little bit. Um, sure. uh, how you started out working for Chesky. Was Chesky your first foray into audiophile? No, no. I, I worked before Chesky. I was working at Sound by Singer in New York. I, I was a I was a retail salesman for sixteen years. Okay. And in the middle of that period is when I met Chesky. Right. Okay. Um, and do you did you you so you were working at a retail store? How did mm -hmm. you meet him? Chesky. Yeah. Uh, well. Um, the, the Chesky brothers, David and Norman, were sort of everywhere in those days. You know, they were building their company and there was a lot of interest and they were trying to sell their records at the store sent by Sanger. So they would drop by every now and then with new records for us to sell, that sort of thing. So I was aware of them. But, but really the way I got hooked up with Chesky was with uh, their engineer, Bob Katz. And I know Bob Katz long before there was a Chesky record. So Bob invited me to the third Chesky session because bef before there were Chesky sessions, Chesky was basically a classical uh, reissue label, a lot of RCA stuff. So, but then they started doing original recording in I think 1989, and on the third session, uh, Bob invited Bob Katz, the engineer, invited me to the session, and I was there to observe and keep my mouth shut, which is what I did, except that David kept asking me, uh, so what do you think? <laughs> so as we were, as the session was rolling on, we immediately had a chemistry, Dave Chesky and I, and because I just instinctively knew what he wanted these records to sound like. And I was, he, since he kept asking me, I kept giving it opinions. And that was basically how our friendship started. And we're, we still talk two or three times a week, we see each other. Well, pre-COVID, we saw each other all the time. So uh, yeah, hanging out at Chesky Sessions was, uh, was, was fun and a lot of work and actually can be very stressful because recording live to two track is uh, inherently stressful, mostly stressful for the musicians, but by extension, by extension the people recording the music, it's, it's, it's stressful. So I started working at the sessions not that long after, basically initially as a schlepper, and, uh, you know, doing a lot of, you know, connecting cables and stuff. And then I just basically became, for lack of a better word, an associate producer to the sessions. So, um, but it was, it was a very exciting time because the idea in these early sessions were done at RCA Studio A on 46th Street. So RCA Studio was a legendary studio. Everybody recorded there, Sinatra, the New York Philharmonic, uh, everybody. And uh, matter of fact, Chesky did the last session at RCA Studio A, which was Mongo Santa Maria. And um, it was a great room. It was huge. You could, you could record a symphony orchestra there. Matter of fact, one day when we were starting a session, the night before we were there, uh, they were recording uh, a score for the movie Cape Fear for uh, Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear. And they still had a 5.1 channel monitoring setup in the control room that was sort of had to like move away. Because I, actually, I think that session was pretty much done, but for some reason they left their 5.1 system there. So a lot, a lot of things went through that studio. And then that studio, then RCA sold us, you know, was sold to BMG, and then BMG didn't really do that much recording, so they didn't need the studio, and they just they sold it and it was no longer a studio. After BMG sold it, it became uh, just an office building, that, that part of the office building. That was a very long answer. I don't want to talk that long about that stuff. So, you know, one thing I want to ask you guys, and I'm being somewhat snarky here, is the name of your club, the San Francisco Audiophile Society. That's what it is, right? That's what it is, Mr. New Yorker. Okay. What about it? it? Well, uh, I like your attitude. That's good. Um, well, then it's called the audiophile society as opposed to the audio side society because one of the first things I ever wrote happened because I was at a party there were a lot of audiophiles there and I walked up to each one and asked them a very direct question are you an audiophile and 
four out of five, five out of six said, oh no, no, I, I like music. And I was, I knew that something like that was going to happen, but I was just surprised that almost all of them were in denial that they were audiophiles. Matter of fact, one guy had a Rockport turntable, which was then, you know, like a forty or fifty thousand dollar turntable. His name was David, and I walked up to him and said, "So, David, are you an audiophile?" And he said, "Oh, no, no, I, I like music." And I said, "You know, you don't need to own a fifty thousand dollar turntable to play records, yeah. but maybe, just maybe." It's because you want your records to sound as good as they can, which would kind of make you an audiophile, right? He had a hard time saying yes to that, to those questions. So I turned that into one of the fir first things, or one of the first things I wrote, it was for positive feedback. And it was called, Are We Not Audiophiles? You know, like Devo, Are We Not Men, We Are Devo. So um, it became a theme that I, I kept coming back to. And a lot of things I've written and videos that I've made is that other hobbies that people have, you know, had, pardon me, mostly men have, like cars, you know, the guy that owns 27 Corvettes, if you want to ask him if he's really into cars, he wouldn't say, nah, they're just transportation, I just use them to get to work, or if you ask the guy that owned, you know, 92 Leica cameras or something, he wouldn't say, photography, it's, it's okay. No, they would be passionate about these things, but audiophiles, for the most part, always deny it. And I'm, it's, I guess it's a guilty pleasure. I, I don't really, I still, even though I've been pondering this question for a long time, I still don't really understand. It's just makes them uncomfortable to consider that. Now my, I, before I, I just wanna finish off with this, is my whole definition of audiophile is very, very simple. and has actually nothing to do with the gear you own. The only thing in Steve's, definition. The only thing that makes someone an audiophile is that they they listen to recorded music without at times without multitasking. If you can listen to music at times without multitasking, I think you're an audiophile. And then you may eventually be interested in getting better and better gear. Because in one of these little forays that I did when I was still working for CNET, I walked around the CNET office and I asked many people that I was minimally friendly with and said, uh, do you ever listen to music uh, without multitasking? And they all looked at me like I was insane. Like, I don't why would I do that? I don't understand the question. <laughs> it's like, because the, the people that made the music that you like put a lot of work into making these recordings. And maybe if you actually paid attention to them, you'd get more out of their music. And they, they, they literally shook their heads like, I, I don't understand the question. So. Clearly, they they were not ready to be audiophiles. I think you're in safe company here, Steve. Oh, good. I figured, you know, the name of the group. So, so I felt comfortable already. When we first talked, you said, you know, is there a difference between West Coast and East Coast audiophiles? Right. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's one of the differences here. I, I think uh, unabashedly, you know, it's it's like you say, if you've got an a Ferrari to say you're not into cars is kind of absurd. If you've got X amount of dollars in your stereo, which many of us do, mm -hmm. all of us have X amount. It's just how much. <laughs> right. um, how many then, X's? Yeah. Then obviously you're an audiophile and to, to deny it is kind of like, so, so I like your explanation though, because it takes the gear out of the equation. It just says, do you listen? And, and, that's it. Uh, right. And if you and if you do listen, what follows is that you would at some point care about the way it sounded and then want to make it sound better. Yeah. But I, I think I was I think I was basically born an audiophile. I was obsessed with sound at a very early age. I remember everybody, you, you guys remember uh, like uh, transistor radios we'd walk around with the six transistor, eight transistor radios, right? And I would have this radio, this AM radio, and I would mistune the radio so that I got static. And I would just listen to static. I was fascinated by the sound of static. And I learned that as I tuned, you know, closer and further away from radio stations, I could modulate the, the static. I could change the way the static sounds. So I was playing 
the static. I would do this for hours. My mother would be like, freak out, stop doing that. Why are you listening to noise? I said, it's not noise. It's, it's really interesting noise, you know? So, and my other really ex early experience with being just obsessed with sound is my family had a big, uh, I guess, a Wurlitzer jukebox. And uh, I would lie on the floor in front of the jukebox and play it and just listen to the ice. It probably had 15 inch woofers in it. It was, you know, this big gigantic thing. And just listen to the sound of that bass, you know, ro rolling over my body. It was a physical, visceral experience to listen to music for me. And so it wasn't just about the music, it was about the sound of the music in, in whatever form it was, you know, it was, was really important to me. And, and by the way, one of my other careers, which was a very big, it was a very long career, I was, I was a movie theater projectionist for 25 years. So I had really big sound systems in movie theaters to play with. And uh, for many of the theaters that I worked in, I would program the intermission music and I would sort of have it relate to the movie itself. You know, if it was a scary movie, it would be, you know, and, uh, and that was so much fun. And I would play this music and then I would, you know, and I would, originally I set them up as um, on reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I would record reel-to-reel -reel tapes and have like a maximum of like 20 minutes or so for the intermission and then figure out a sequence of things. And I just was so into it. And I would, you know, before the theater opened, I would go down into the theater and listen to how, how it sounded over the all tech voice of the theaters that were behind the screen in this theater compared to what I was listening to at home. And, and one of the things I learned is that if you play a recording, a, a standard issue recording over a theater size sound system that's reasonably good, it makes it sound more real, more, closer to life size, closer to what it would be if it wasn't a recording, you know, depending on the recording, obviously. But those things were, well, I was definitely an audio file by the time I was doing that in movie theaters, but having access to movie theater sound systems of various sizes and quality was part of my education, hugely so. Well, that's fantastic. So um, you, when we first talked to you, said you wanted to know what differentiates West Coast audiophiles from East Coast audiophiles. And I had the, the question in my mind, well, is there anything to do with the size of one's dwelling, which I think dwellings tend to be a little bit smaller on the East Coast because right. space is a premium. And so my first question to you would be, is your system set up based upon your space that you have? And if you had a larger space, do you think you'd have a different system? Well, I mean, I, I live in, a, in an office, a building that it's a co-op building that started out, started out life in 1922 as an office building. And it, be, it was converted into living spaces in about 1985 and I arrived here in 1989. So it was basically um, some of the floors closer to the top of this building. It's a 30 story building or, or smaller, but they're all relatively big. And on my floor, it's about, it's four apartments on my floor. So that by New York City standards, it's not, it's not small. Uh, and my, my, built, my apartment is basically the, the negative space between, between two adjacent apartments. So it's not a rectangular room. It's an odd shaped room, which makes it really good for sound. And uh, I'm gonna make an announcement to you guys first. No one knows this except my friends, like actually uh, Herb, Herb knows about it, is that I'm in the process of buying another apartment in this building. And then that apartment is not gonna be for audio. It's gonna be for my wife's, my wife is an artist and she's gonna use that that second apartment as her studio. That means that I get to have her space in our present apartment. So my space is about to get significantly bigger. So um, I, it, like I said, my room isn't a rectangle, so it's hard to actually describe. It's, it's basically about, well, if you subtract my bedroom, it, it's about 800 square feet. So it's not tiny, not huge. 
Um, but you know, the, the thing that I had as working as a salesman for many years is being in many, many, many people's homes with audio. And you know, even wealthy people can have relatively small apartments in, in New York City. So like an average room for a New York City audiophile would be, you know, maybe uh, 12 by 18. That's oh. nice. That, that's, so obviously some are bigger and some are smaller, but I would say that's the average, maybe a, a tiny bit bigger than that. And so what about you guys? Oops. Well, I, I live in a I live in a, a small townhome, Steve, here in the East Bay, um, uh -huh. California, and it's an open floor plan. Um, uh -huh. And um, I actually I, I write for the Absolute Sound, so I have to do a lot of reviewing of gear. Um, okay. And uh, but I have the fortune the good fortune that um, uh, even though I sit fairly close to the speakers, like you often do when listening to Harbath's near field or quasi near field. Mm. I have a 40 foot long hallway that goes back to my bedroom. So there's no back wall effectively. Oh. Uh, and I, actually I actually talked to um, Clayton Shaw when I was thinking about getting his speakers in at one point about this L-shaped divider between my living area and my kitchen area because it's open floor plan. He said for base energy or base wavelengths that doesn't matter at all. It's as if it's not there. Right. Um, so I actually, even though this space is fairly small, I live in a townhome of approximately a thousand square feet. Um, it's surprisingly good sounding uh, because of the fact that there's no, effectively no back wall uh, mm -hmm. in my space when I listen. So it works out well um, for, you know, speakers up to about the size of Harbor 30.2s, which are my main speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had larger Dynadios in here, which I still own that work pretty well as well. But um, I would be reluctant to put anything larger in this space than that. But do you, what, what is the construction like? What are the floors and what are the walls? Oh, so the walls are drywall, the floors are laminate, um, but I'm, I'm paying a lot of attention lately to uh, some of the products by Norm Varney at, at, um, at um, AV Room Services and okay. thinking about decoupling the speakers from the floor so you don't get mechanical coupling between the floor and the uh -huh. wall, and get mm -hmm. 70 hertz. Um, sound pressure waves from the wall. So I pay a lot of attention to that. I'm a scientist by training. And so I, I think about transfer functions and all that sort of thing in terms of what's going on with the energy. Okay. Level. So. Yeah, that sounds great. So, but what, what would you say? You've been in many audiophiles homes in, in San Francisco. I, I'm sure there's a range, big ones, small ones, but what, what would you consider the average? Um, I would say probably comparable to what you find there on the East Coast, about a 12 by 18 room. Okay. Um, you know, the homes here are bigger. Um, as folks that live here in the Bay Area know, median home prices are pretty darn high as, as an average, you know. Um, and so the folks that own nice systems tend to have homes large enough where they can you know, okay. have a pretty decent sounding room. I would mm -hmm. say that what I've observed typically is that folks don't pay attention to two principal things enough, which is the uh, acoustical treatment of the room um, in terms of diffusers or, you know, um, uh, base energy management, and mm -hmm. also putting speakers that are too large for the room in the room. Um, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. But do people, do people, you have, you, you guys have basements? Is that a thing? No. Not in California. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> that's why I was asking, okay. We got basements here and people and audiophiles that have their systems in the basements are, it's pretty hard to make great sound in basements. That's what I've observed. The other thing is that, you know, we, we do frame construction here for earthquake resistance. So there's, there's effectively no brick structures in Northern California or Southern California as well, uh, because brick does not do well when there's seismic things going on. So everything right. is, is, is wooden frame construction, principally with drywall. Um, uh -huh. yeah. The floors well, are, are cement slab for the most part. Yeah, cement slabs make me nervous. Though. Why is that? Why? It just the energy that goes into this uh, cement slab does weird things. Maybe in terms of reflecting back into the speaker. Um, would, would would isolating the speaker be beneficial? Yes. I've been looking yeah. hard at iso optics. Yeah. Rather yeah. than using tiptoes or cones or something, yeah. I have these 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 isolators. I just started playing with them from EVP. I forgot what EVP stands for, um, but.
but they're like a weight, like a sandwich of of steel, um, uh, um, fiberglass, and steel. So and some rubber at each end. They look like, and that's the what they look like. Wow, what a great uh, illustration! Yeah, yeah. I think those things are so far. I'm really impressed with those. I'm very impressed with them as well. And just to get to Brian's question. I have a friend that um, has a home, custom listening room up in Davis, designed by an audio engineer in Davis for his room. And he has Martin Logan 13As. And I told him he should try these and put them under his speakers. And he said, why, I'm on the slab floor. I said, everything everything has a resonant energy. And I can mm -hmm. assure you, your floor is resonating and it's coupling to your speakers and it's coupling to the walls and it's creating problems for you. And he was reluctant, but he put them under his speakers. And he called me and said, I can't believe the improvement that these made, putting these on my slab floor under my big speakers. What, what is that? So we've been called? screwing up all these years with tiptoes and spikes, yes. basically. Yeah. Do you remember Art Dudley advising to remove all spikes and throw them in the trash? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't remember. But it sounds like something he would say. He That's didn't like problem. remote controls either. Throw those in the trash. Brian, these are EVPs by AV Room Service designed by Norm Varney. I, I can post the link for you guys. Please, please do. Yeah, they're great. Hey, Steve, you might remember reviewing the speakers behind me. I bought them on your advice. Oh, I hope you like them. Uh, Ten years later, happy. <laughs> okay, I guess that's good. My, my wife says you can get any speaker you want, but we will never sell the Tannoys. Oh, wow. So you Which ones are they? I can't, I can't see well enough to see what they are. The Kensington you reviewed in 2010. You, you oh, held, oh you yeah, yeah, in yeah. Like yeah. a fish with your favorite word, visceral. Visceral, yeah. I, yeah, I overuse visceral, right? I, I love gotta, it, though. I got to use visceral less. But thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So it's Yeah, well, I, I had, I had a, a real experience uh, maybe two years ago with a Tannoy Arden, a vintage one, not, a, not the current Arden, at a store, a stair exchange in the city. And it was, the, the experience was that it sounded, I, I listened to a, all 1970s systems. So it was a Gerard turntable, an audio research SP3, a D110 power amplifier, and the Ardens and the other stuff. And I was playing only 1970s music on it. So I wanted to be traveling through time. And I started from maybe 10 feet away from the speakers and I was, I was into it. And then I backed up 10 feet because it was a big room. I was like, you know, I like this even better. And then I, I wound up about 30 feet away from the speaker. I was just playing them a little bit louder every time I backed up. And I said, I can't imagine too many skinny modern speakers being able to do what these speakers did and 45 year old speakers. So I, I got a thing about, it just sort of planted a seed about speakers like that. And that's why it, it turned out that the speakers that I used, not Arden's, but um, Klipsch Cornwalls. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it serves the same function sure. for me. Somebody asked a question about how long you generally keep components in your system. Are there components that you're reluctant to part with, but that you feel you need to part with because you have to have a turnover to keep your reviews fresh? Um, it's not any specific number, but I would say uh, two years would be a long time. A year, around a year would be sort of average. Um, because you know this whole idea of, of a reviewer having a reference system, I know I know that sounds good on paper, but the reality is is that my system was always changing anyway because I have to send something back, and so it was just this always in a, in a state of flux. So um, I, I'm a pretty adaptable guy, and you know actually I like having different sounds. I spent many years having opposite speakers as my main reference speakers. I had Magnapans and Zoo speakers simultaneously. And I would, when I wasn't reviewing speakers, I would, for my own pleasure, I was having, you know, a couple of weeks with Magnapan, a couple of weeks with Zoos. I mean, they're really, really different speakers. And I love doing that. I had TAD ME1s, I think at the same time I had Magnapans. But I just kept, look, I wanted opposite sounding speakers. I'm not the type who believes that I'm um, 
getting closer and closer to like perfect sound forever or something. I, I like the opposite. You're hearing different aspects of recording by having speakers that are very different sounding. And same for tubes and solid state and same for digital and analog. You're just hearing this, this music in, in a different way. And none of the ways, none of the ways are true. You know, there, there's no ultimate truth. My favorite stereophile cover of all time, and I don't think I'm the only one that had this observation. It was um, some big Krell amplifier and a carry 805. And, and the text on the cover said, if one of these is right, the other one must be wrong. Now, the right one and the wrong one would depend on who it was that was listening to them. But there is no right answer. And even if you were present at the recording session and you and it was a straight ahead audiophile recording, they didn't have a lot of mixing and effects and stuff. Even then, listening to a recording over different, it, it's not like you, you say, oh yeah, this is the one in anything that I would change from here on would somehow diminish that, that reality of what I was hearing on that session. I don't really think so. I think it's so different. Recorded music, you know, it's like George Martin, when he recorded the Beatles, he didn't hear what was in those recordings, right? It's so much easier to put the sound in the recording than it is to get it out of the recording. So what he, what he heard out of those recordings as the decades roll by, he was probably pretty surprised as to what was in those recordings and he was there. So there's, there's no ultimate truth in audio. We, we can think that there is, but I don't really believe there is. Well, I, I think a lot of us experience that who are older and who listened on our stereos from our youth to a mm -hmm. recording. And now that we have quote, more audiophile, higher resolution systems, you listen to that recording and go, I had no idea that there were those backup singers in there. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's, that's one of the things that I think if I can speak for the whole world is part of your broad appeal as an audiophile reviewer or uh, promoter is that you, you don't have this uh, idea of there's an absolute sound and everything has to sound like this. It's not like there, it's the Mondovino, you know, the wine doesn't taste like this, it's no good. Mm -hmm. And you actively promote having multiple systems so that you can hear the same music or different music through different systems. So right. um, do you, do, how long have you been doing CNET or excuse me, the Audiophiliac daily? Uh, a little over three years. And do you have any idea how many episodes you produced? A little over a thousand. But the, th the thing is that the really early ones, well, let's say the first year at least, they were all really short, they were two minutes or three minutes or five minutes and there was no edits. I didn't do any editing in a video until maybe a year and a half ago. So I could knock out many at a, at a, at a clip and, and that's when I was doing them seven days a week. So I, I had an idea that if I could just have so many, just get as many out there as, as quickly as possible as people were searching for reviews and audio, they would keep coming back to me. So it's a really crowded world on YouTube. Although it's funny to think that just three years ago, there were a lot fewer audio review channels as there are now, but um, <clears throat> that was my plan. And that, that's the plan that worked. I didn't really plan on uh, leaving CNET. What, the real thing that was going on was that I wanted CNET to give me uh, basically a video podcast. And I had been on many CNET podcasts over the years. And I said, I like doing video. And uh, I think I could bring my audience from my blog uh, to the channel and to, uh, to, this, to these podcasts. And you guys would make money because they would, you know, um, you, people could buy ads that couldn't buy ads on CNET. The website could afford to buy the ads for these podcasts. So I pitched and pitched and pitched and it was, two years of, of doing pitches and doing pilot episodes and they kept saying uh, we don't really think there's enough there to attract an audience 
So the only reason I started the YouTube channel was to prove to see that, that there was. And maybe two months into doing it, I realized that I didn't want it to be on CNET. I wanted it to just be what it was because once it was gonna be on CNET, I'd have to fit it into the CNET format, which at that point, having tasted the freedom of not doing it that way, was much more interesting to me than just slotting it into whatever they wanted it to be. Are there and others, then, are there I'm other sorry? reviewers that you happen to enjoy listening to? On YouTube? Yeah, or anywhere on the internet. Uh, well, YouTube, you know, it's funny. YouTube is my world, so to speak. So I, I really enjoy uh, Sean. His site is called Zero Fidelity. And we've become friends over the years. And uh, he's really good. He's really good. And I really like Jay at Next Best Thing Studio. And Jay is amazing because he's really young. I think he's 26 or 27 years old. And I interviewed him and he told me by the time he was 23, 24, he had owned 60 pairs of speakers. And I said, you're my guy. <laughs> and he works, he works at Audio Excellence in, in Toronto. So he's working in a store. So he's experiencing what I experienced having worked in a store where when you're a reviewer, if you're Steve or John Atkinson or Harry Pearson, you basically experience one product at a time as you're reviewing them in a sequence, one, then the next one, then the next one. But if you work in a store, you got a whole store full of things. It's an erector set. You take it apart, you put it together, you take it to people's homes. And Jay having that experience of hearing so much gear in so many situations, yeah, he knows a lot about audio. So it's like, he's like a, 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 you know, he's like me <laughs> at that age, practically. So I'm really excited about him and he's really, he's working it. He works really hard. I think he, that's a great channel. Uh, there's, there's quite a few, this guy, uh, Andrew Robinson is, um, he is, he calls himself the, uh, the recovering audiophile, which kind of annoys me because <laughs> Uh, then you're not an audio fan. Then why That's do you have right. a YouTube channel? Why are you giving advice about <laughs> buying audio? Why don't you just, you know, go fishing or something? Um, but anyway, he's good. He, you know, it's not my thing what he's doing, but it's interesting to see these people doing it because it's, you know, I'm, I'm saying this as an official, as Herb likes to call it, genuine old person. Herb and I are about the same age. And he, when he turned 70, he said, I'm now genuine old. And I said, <laughs> That's true, you are, and, and so am I. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's like um, the writing part of high-end audio, the journalistic part uh, is mostly old guys. And uh, I'm saying that because I am one of those old guys and I wrote for a lot of, I wrote for pretty much every magazine, every US magazine, except for, um, Sound and Vision. Well, actually, in the end, I did write for it. So I pretty much wrote for everybody. And, um, and everybody aged. I, I did a stereophile as we see it a few years ago. And I said, 40 years ago, John Atkinson was 40 years younger. And I was 40 years younger. And Dan D'Agostino was 40 years younger. And Andy Singer was 40 years younger. And the people that read the magazine were decades younger. And the people who bought audio were decades younger. When I was selling high-end audio in the late 70s and early 80s, my customers weren't mostly 60 and 70 year old men. They were in their 30s and 40s. I mean, there were older guys, but the majority of them by far were in their 30s and 40s. So everybody aged, <laughs> the people who wrote about it, the people who made it, the people who wrote, they all got older and you're saying, but where are the young guys? Why aren't there more younger people behind us? Well, now I know where they are. They're on YouTube. So, you know, it means it does continue. It's sad that the magazines and for the lesser degree, the, the websites haven't had that, that hasn't worked that as well. I mean, I guess the only guy who's sort of in the middle there is John Darko. And he has a YouTube channel, but he also has a website. And he's, I think he just turned 50. So he's sort of straddling generations there. But I want more younger guys uh, you know, or women. You know, 
Steve, um, John did a recent interview with someone, I, I forget, but I, I listened to his podcast weekly, and he, was, he actually referenced you as one of the folks that has been around long enough to hear enough gear to kind of have a broad sense of kind of where the high-end audio market is these days. Mm -hmm. and he's, one of his challenges is, is he constantly gets comments from folks saying like, well, how does, how does that, what, what you're reviewing compare to this or that? And, and he always has to issue a disclaimer like, if I haven't heard it, I can't make a comparison for you. Right. Like, you know, and he said there's very few people that 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 have been around long enough that had the breadth of experience to be able to speak to these things. And he mentioned you and Atkinson, you know, having okay. been around long enough to kind of have this knowledge base of how these different products kind of you know compare things. Yeah, it's sort of like, it's sort of like wine tasting. You have to have a sonic memory in a sense, and I'm not yeah. sure everyone has that either. Yeah, I think I, I, I kind of do. But the, but the problem is, is that uh, I'm not complaining, but I do a, literally 100 reviews a year at this point. So, you know, a serial file writer but does basically one a month or a column if they have, do a review and a column. So maybe they do two a month or three a month. But I do uh, basically two a week. Um, so I, a lot of stuff passes through. I'm not spending a huge amount of time with any given product. So the, I mean, the important products uh, that I have a real keen interest in, those reviews stretch out over time. Like I was, I had the corn, the Clips Cornwalls probably for at least six weeks before I did a review. So some of them are around longer before I do the review, but many of them, it's a day or two that I'm gonna do with it. So, um, it's, it's, I, I, to be honest about it, I, I, you know, the thing about writing reviews, I have to be um, <laughs> honest, as they say, is that what is communicated in a review, um, a Starify review, an Absolute Sound review, that requires 3,000 words? Because a, a lot of the time it just turns into, I, then I play blah, 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 and then I play blah, 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 and then I play blah, blah. It's like, but in terms of, Describing the product, and to me, the most important thing about describing the product isn't that it has a six inch woofer, it's that what's interesting about the product, to, to, to describe everything that's in a speaker or an amplifier or a DAC or something, I personally don't find all that interesting. I wanna know more about the, the story of the product, you know? It, it, it's interesting that companies like um, Zoo or Magnapan or Clips or Shit Audio those companies are singular. There's not another zoo. There's not another ship. There's not another magnapan. There's really not another. So that, that makes them automatically, yeah, I want to review that. But if it's just another thing that's just like a lot of other things, yeah, they might, I, you know, I'll work on a little bit. I'll figure out something but the ones that have more personality. And, and that brings up this thing that Herb and I share is you know this fascination with Nelson Pass and his first watt amplifiers, where Nelson comes right out and says it. It's not about making an amp that measures well, that has you know better and better distortion measurements. He's like, no, it has second harmonic. It's part of the sound of the amplifier. He said, you know, I make pass amplifiers that are the ones that are measure the better measuring amplifiers. But if you are looking for something that has a flavor to it, you know, that and then you're potentially the kind of person that would buy a first watt or maybe a, an old tube amplifier, you know. So I, I reviewed recently the, uh, a Macintosh C22 preamp that hadn't really been. Um, it's not wasn't you know lovingly updated at that point when I when I had it. It was really old sounding. It was really juicy and warm and visceral and just very ripe. It made everything sound beautiful, not accurate, just beautiful, right? And that's that presses a lot of buttons for me because especially with something like a preamp, you could have when you when you're in the accurate mood or more neutral mood, you could have your solid state. Preamp. And then when you want to make Led Zeppelin sound like it did in, you know, 1968, you could play the Macintosh and just revel in that wonderfulness, right? So it's not, it's never going to be a one size fits all. It's like what, what, it, you know, each audiophile has to figure out their own path as to what it is that's going to make 
make it work for them. So can you talk about how you get equipment to review? There's some suspicion among the public that to, to get something reviewed in Stereophile or the Absolute Sound, you need to pay to play. You have to have some advertising dollars, go to the magazine, and then maybe they'll review your things. Um, are you uh, able to just get things from local stores or you get them directly from the manufacturers? Um, how, when you pick something, do you get that? Uh, I just ask. <laughs> um, I don't get everything I ask for. And a lot of things I ask for, I wind up not actually reviewing. I mean, I should, I should explain that, uh, first of all, the whole pay to play thing. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't, I would never, and I have never done anything like that, remotely like that. But the thing is, I, I would admit to being very subjective in my reviews. I'm giving, certainly in YouTube reviews, but also when I was writing, I'm giving you my impressions. And part of my impressions, and I think I'm pretty direct about this, is how I feel about the company, about the people at the company or the, the designer of the product or something. You know, we can't, we, well, we could, we could try to pretend that we're no, there's nothing there. We just being 100% objective judges of these products. Um, no, I don't think that, I don't think I would ever say that, that, that I'm 100% I'm objective. I have feelings about products and I think I'm pretty explicit in describing those those products you know i i'm not going to tell you who it was but i was going to review a preamp and the designer said to me that he never actually listens to them he just measures them <laughs> and i said i can tell <laughs> i can tell you never listen because they don't sound that good and um and I remember Jim Teal saying that he only listened at the very end. He wasn't like refining, refining, refining. He was working, you know, uh, you know, on a desktop designing, and then he would have a prototype and he would listen. But it wasn't like a listening experience. Now, Andrew Jones and you guys have heard Andrew speak. Now, I don't know if he ever said this, this part to you, but he told me that he started out in the audio business at Kep but he never designed anything for Kef. At Kef, he measured things. He measured Kef speakers and he measure, measured the competition speakers. And he, I don't remember how long he was there, three years or something. He said he had so much experience measuring and listening that the idea of correlating what measurements mean is, is the thing that makes Andrew Jones, Andrew Jones. Because all over the internet, there are people that measure speakers and stuff. But they don't know, they can't really um, understand what it is they're measuring. It's, they, they can just say, oh, look, there's a peak here. It's, but that's not, that's not the point. I mean, measure, Andrew once told me this thing, I thought it was really interesting. He said, he designs, let's say a tweeter, and then they build a prototype tweeter for them, just one. They send it to him and then he measures the tweeter. And he said, but if the tweeter doesn't measure as I anticipated it would, the first thing he doesn't do is say there's something wrong with the tweeter. He's like, I have to figure out, I'm not, I don't think I'm getting everything here. I need to figure out how to better measure this tweeter. Because even for Andrew Jones, just sticking up the microphone in front of the, of the speaker isn't really enough. You have to be able to understand and interpret what measurements are telling you. And that's what's lost on so many people who measure things for just amateurs on the internet or even as many professional reviewers who, who measure. You know, I, I, I just have to, because I enjoyed it so much. When I was uh, writing for Tile Hertzens for Inner Fidelity, now he's a real measurement kind of guy. And uh, he would, uh, we would have these debates. We would have these, these, these long phone conversations and uh, he would say, this, this headphone measures well and blah, blah, blah. And I would say, but I just listen to them. I'm not measuring, I'm just listening and I'm writing reviews based on what I heard. And I said, but here's the thing, you measure and say product X is good because it measures well. And, he, and then he would listen. And I said, but the, the reader might conclude that since Tile's reviews 
were objective and Steve's reviews were subjective, but Steve's just telling you how he feels. Eh, maybe he was in a bad mood that day when he reviewed that product. But, but Tile is giving you the objective truth about this product. So I said to Tile, let's do a debate. So we did a debate over the phone and you know, recorded the debate and then we transcribed it and we tweaked it and we, and we put it out. And then we also did a similar debates in front of people occasionally. But I would, oh, me being me, I would always start the debate by saying, but, but here's the thing, Tile, you, the original um, Sennheiser HD800, you said was the best measuring headphone you ever heard, you ever measured, but you didn't like the way it sounded. And you also said that the original Bowers and Wilkins P5 headphone was a very mediocre measuring headphone, but you enjoyed listening to it. And I'd say, that's true, right? You said those things. And he said, yes. And I said, well, I think I just won the debate because the better measuring headphone isn't the better sounding headphone necessarily. And the, more, the average or not outright awful measuring headphone can be very enjoyable. So the measurements, if the measurements are there to guide the, the reader, towards the better product, they can be helpful or they can be wildly uh, misleading because you're saying, it ain't Steve just given his, his opinion off the top of his head, it's got measurements to prove it's better. Steve just says how he feels. This guy says, this is it. This is the objective truth. Neither of them guarantees success. You could, I could do a rave review about a product and you could listen to it and hate it, okay? And then you could buy a product that measures really, really well and love it or hate it. So neither, neither type of review is actually ultimately all that helpful. The only thing that's helpful about reviews is that the reader or viewer of the review develops a trust and a relationship with said reviewer over time. You read the review, you hear the product in a store or at a show and you go, yeah, I guess they were, they were right or they were wrong. And you then you sort of, you have an understanding. But without that, a rave review or a negative review is kind of worthless unless you unless you relate to the person who made the review in the first place. That's true of films. And films or wine or you know yeah, tennis rackets or something, right? It's and and the objective review. side of things may only have to do with the equipment we bring to the table. I mean, do we all have the same ears? Probably, but we don't have the same brains. So how we interpret sure. that sound coming into our heads <laughs> is going to be very different. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you took if you took your system and moved it to the opposite wall of your room, it would sound different, right? So there's no there's no there there to say to lock it down and say this is what this thing sounds like. I I mean, I've done that in many rooms that I've lived in over the years. Just move it to another wall; it sounds different. Move to another apartment; it definitely sounds different. So when you're going through all this work of trying to nail down what this thing, this speaker, this amplifier sounds like, it's not really that useful because it, it depends on everything else. It depends, maybe you ate a pizza that's given you agita, you know, it's not going to sound this good, right? So who knows? You don't know. So I'm going to let you guys in on a, on a big, on a secret about reviewers or certainly this reviewer. It's entertainment. I want it to be entertaining. That's like the single most important thing about a review is that it's somehow interesting enough to get you to watch the whole thing or read the whole thing. And that it made you smile or laugh or say, oh, I got to check out that recording or something. That's to me as good as it gets. The actual usefulness of the review, well, you know, people tell me that they bought something that I you know, gave a good review to and they agree with me. And that, when I hear that, that's very, very nice. And not too many times that people say that I was wrong. So I guess overall, it seems to be working. I think, I think I've been doing this for 22 years and it seems to be working out. I think I, sh I can continue at least for a while longer. Can you, think, what do you do when you have something that you find is negative mm -hmm. that didn't turn out to be what you thought it was gonna be? And in, in essence, it might be a piece of junk <laughs> or not very, you know, that kind of thing. Well, usually I don't review it. Because the thing is, um, doing a negative review, especially of a product that no one's ever heard of, is really kind of useless. Because I'm going to tell you about something you don't know about and say, this is bad, don't buy it. So I normally wouldn't do that review. I have done negative reviews at CNET because at CNET, I was assigned products to review. 
I didn't have any choice. They said, review this and I would. But when I'm picking the products to review, I would rarely do a negative review because it wasn't, it wasn't useful. Um, I did a negative review of the, of the Apple true wireless in-ear headphones. I did it, I'll put this kind of, I did a review like that because I went to an Apple store, I sat there and I listened to it and I took notes and, and I thought, this doesn't sound like a $250 headphone to me. It's like, you can get way better sounding headphones for, for le a lot less money than this. But people buy them because they're Apple and blah, blah, blah. So I did that because I knew that I couldn't hurt Apple. It's not like Apple stock would go down because Steve did a negative review on, the, on that headphone. But if I, if I did a, re a negative review and really tore something up that could actually hurt that company, I, I don't want to do that. I just wouldn't do anything. And, and, and I, and I want to circle back to this idea that I have relationships with companies. I, meaning I have friendly relationships with them. And if a company that I like the people and generally like their products and they sent me something to review and I didn't like it, I just wouldn't review it. I'm not going to write a pause or make a positive review of a product I don't like just because I like the people. <laughs> That's never going to happen. That has happened many times. And it's an awkward thing because they think at some point, oh, Steve's going to always be nice to us and, and do negative and do positive reviews when I absolutely don't do that. Have you given Many some of the manufacturers feedback and, and had them act on some of that feedback? That's one of the things that I like to do if I've got a piece of gear. I don't do much reviewing, nothing like you, but, mm. but I've done a little bit, right? And, and, and I don't publish all their reviews because if, if there's a product that I get and I don't like it, I'll write maybe a, a half a page or a page of my findings and send it back to the manufacturer so that they can improve the product, but I won't publish anything. Yeah, Have you ever I, done that and had any luck with them actually listening? To, they, don't, they don't listen to me very much, but they might listen to you, right? <laughs> they, I have. I don't, I don't n normally do that, and they almost never really listen to me. But I'll tell you, funny, recently, I reviewed the Audio Research um, LS28 SE. And um, now I'm... I don't remember now exactly, but I think the only speakers that I was using at the time of that review were the Klipsch Cornwalls. They're very high sensitivity speakers. The volume control on that preamp goes from zero to 103. This is kind of odd, right? <laughs> zero to one, it's kind of weird. So um, I would say when I was listening at sort of medium-ish levels, I was at 12 or 13 or something, right? When I listen loud, as loud as I ever listen, it would be 27, 28, something like that. It goes to 103. And I said to him, you know, you, there's too much gain or the taper of this pot is, isn't, doesn't give you enough latitude at the low end. Um, so you could just basically, you know, it's not a pot pot, you know, it's basically some sort of converter. You could just create a different taper so that at more moderate levels, you'd be at 40 or 50. So remember, it goes to 103. And they said, yeah, but you know, most of our customers use Wilson speakers and they're, and they're relatively low sensitivity and they're already up there at 40 or 50. And I said, but if they're up at 40 or 50, <laughs> they never get to 103. It just seems like having all that you're using it, you know what it is at the end. It's an attenuator, right? It's not turning things up; it's turning things down. And you're you're never at you know using the gain of the preamp. You're always in the negative territory. So, I let them know that I, that I found that kind of annoying. Oh, and the other thing I made a, a deal, I, and I meant I mentioned that in the review, but I also mentioned that the remote on this ten thousand dollar preamp was really awful. It was made out of plastic and they, and they told me that, well, they used to have a metal remote, but the supplier for the metal remote uh, stopped making them and they're looking for a replacement. And I said, so will you, when you get a replacement, will you give all the people that bought your $10,000 preamp, will you give them <laughs> the metal remote instead of this $5 plastic remote? Or I'm making up this $5. But um, I never really got a straight answer, but that kind of stuff. I did the review. I liked the product a lot, but I had those and other concerns, but those were the ones that kind of annoyed me. So that kind of stuff I would do because cool. basically it's a, it's a good product and it's a great company. I really like audio research. So I, I think Steve, when you're writing reviews, you know, from what I've gathered from your reviews, I've been watching them for about a year and a half now. 
is I think you're right that you have a sensibility about what you like in you know music and audio equipment. And for me, um, coming from my professional background and now starting to write reviews, it's it's really around the reader getting to know your sensibilities, you know, the, the, you know your style and temperament about mm -hmm. music and audio equipment. And I think you know the goal probably is to be able to for those folks to have an understanding, like, yeah, I'm I'm kind of aligned with Steve's sensibilities, and I that might be a product I might be interested in. I think what that does for the readers is it creates some context of understanding. So they can understand, is this going to be this product, whatever price it is, is it going to be a value proposition for me or not, right? right. And that's where the, that's where I think the value of the, the, of the review comes in, you know, and we all have different definitions of what constitutes a value proposition, right? I'd Some say, yeah. younger folks have a smaller, maybe narrower, this is why shit's been so, you know, successful. You right. know, older folks with more income, you know, probably have a wider one or a higher one. But at the end of the day, it's all around, you know, what creates value for me in creating an engaging musical experience? Right. I mean, again, sounding like the genuine old person that I am and having the experiences that I've had, I think it's really sad that most people who buy audio don't get to hear it at a store before they buy it. You know, I mean, that's, that's why reviewers are more important there because they can't always or even usually hear it and some of them say yeah but i can try it at home first which is better than a store and i'd say well that's true except the one thing is you don't have the expertise of the store helping you or guiding you through this journey and you can't hear speaker a b c d e f and g that way but you could at a store but uh actually andrew robinson this guy I referred to earlier has a channel a, a youtube channel he did one he did a video about this recently that audiophiles were killing high-end audio and he was talking about that they basically would, you know, go to a store, shop the store, listen to all those speakers, and then buy it for less online. And um, you know, and and he also brought up this idea that I I live with when I was when I was a salesman is that I would have customers tell me what the profit margin was on this product. You know, this is a fifty point line, so that two thousand dollar speaker, and he's making a thousand dollars on on that sale. And I'd say. Really, I guess he doesn't have to pay rent every month and he doesn't have to pay me and he doesn't have to pay the air condition a 12,000 square foot store and he doesn't have all these other expenses. So, um, you know, a lot of these people never owned a business or, you know, so thought of it that way. They just saw that big profit margins. And, oh, you guys like to sell cable because there's a lot of margin in cable. Well, yeah, that's true. But that's how they, you know, keep the lights on. Or they did up to a point. Now it's interesting that I used to say, but here in New York City, up until a few years ago, so pre-COVID, that almost all the, there were more high-end stores in New York City five years ago than there were in the golden age in the 70s and 80s. <clears throat> There's like twice as many or more than twice as many. Um, but lately, and even before COVID, more and more of them were moving to smaller spaces that were by appointment only. You couldn't just walk in and, and hear things the way it was in, in the 70s and 80s and, and 90s. But, you know, I, 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 if I wasn't, if I was starting over and I didn't have that option of just going into a store, it just seemed like such a normal thing to do and say, hey, I'm looking for speakers. I want to spend, you know, $2,000, what do you got? What a great way to figure out what you got, even though it's a store and even though it's gonna sound different in your house and all that other stuff, the main value of doing it was in the store, you got to hear one against another against another. So you were hearing them, rel speakers, let's say, relative to each other. It wasn't perfect, but in terms of figuring out what your taste was, it was much better that way. Wish we could you know, go back in time and make all those dealers materialize because people would be better off. But since that's not going to happen, they have me. They <laughs> have you. That's, that's, that's as good as it gets. I'm sorry. I'm sorry it worked out that way. But I do, I really do enjoy um, making videos. I enjoyed writing vid videos, but I mean, I enjoyed writing reviews. But um, the 16 years that I sold high end audio of doing thousands of demos with people and sitting in a room and saying, so what do you think? And then they would say it and that's okay let me try this I, I literally did that many 10,000 times so whatever lots and lots and lots 
So I sort of had this feel of what people are looking for, right? You could play, you know, uh, a soft sounding speaker and they could still tell you it sounds bright to them, right? So it's not like the, the, the language that they were using to describe the sound that was giving me the salesman feedback to help them towards, a, you know, a better outcome wasn't a hundred percent, but by trial and error, we eventually got there or, or not, or they went to another store and bought something else. But w there was a back and forth to it that I really, really miss. Not, not that I would want to go back to being in sales because I really feel like I, <laughs> I did that. I don't need to go back, but um, it, was, it was a great experience. And the, and the other thing I wanted to talk about, by the way, is I thought all those years of meeting so many people in, in the business, the, you know, Dan D'Agostino, just so many that you just felt their passion for, for making these things, you know? Nobody really gets into high-end audio to get rich despite what a lot of people think, right? I once asked David, David Wilson, maybe it was in the year, maybe it was the late 90s, I was asking him about something. And he said, I, if the money that I make, I couldn't buy my most expensive products, you know, whatever, whatever that number was. He said, I can't afford to buy, you know, an X1 or Except a that. Wham or something. He said, I don't make that much money. So even the guys at the, at the top of the craft are not rolling in dough, you know, some of them do, but not most of them. So, uh, but being around them and feeling their passion about what they do for a living and just trying to make better and better products and take real pride in what they do was phenomenal. Absolutely incredible being around so many people. And if you go back, if, I guess if some of you guys used to go to CES and on a regular basis and you'd go and you'd see the high-end exhibits and then the next year you'd go and two thirds of those companies you never heard of didn't make the second time you went. And there was a whole new crop of new companies. And then the next year, most of those were gone and then they would be replaced by other new companies that so many people say, I want to do this and I'm going to spend you know, my savings to do this thing and go to CES and all that and fail. Most of them fail miserably. So, uh, but they do it anyway. That's a beautiful what, thing. What you're talking about that's missing is the dialogue that you can have with a representative or the manufacturer. I remember the first time I went to RMAF and one of my favorite rooms that the entire year there, that I, and I went through all the rooms, was Sean Casey's room, the zoo mm -hmm. room, with a peach tree integrated in. Right. right? It just created this wonderful experience. And Sean is such a wonderful guy to have a conversation with that it was one of the most memorable experiences I had at the entire show. Right, and he was on the floor playing records, right? Not the typical owner of a high-end company. No. Yeah, when I first met Sean, this is a funny story. I, 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 I met him at a show and I wanted to review them. And I was writing for this magazine called Home Entertainment and Design. It was part of the Rob Report. And I went to the editor, <clears throat> Brent Butterworth, and I said, I want to review this speaker. And he goes to the website, he's looking at the speaker. He said, Steve, this can't possibly sound good. <clears throat> and I said, well, here's the difference between me and you. I've heard it and you haven't. So we're, you know, we're having this conversation and he's like, yeah, I can tell you really into it. So you should do the review. So I said, Great. So I get the review. I get, I do the review. And then Sean being Sean, he painted, because in those days they had painted finishes on zoo speakers. He made this incredible like metal flake orange, whatever it was, a Druid a Mark three or four. And he got in his truck and he drove to Malibu where, the, where their offices were. And he goes to the reception area. It's kind of weird to think of a, of a magazine that actually had a reception, but they had a reception. And he goes in and says, hey, I want to see Brent Butterworth. I, I brought speakers for photography. And he wasn't there. So he said, oh, I'll, I'll come back in an hour. So, but can I leave the speakers in the, the, this reception area for the magazine? He said, sure. So, so he, he drops off these two, the, this pair of metal flake orange speakers. And when he comes back, like everybody's going gaga over the speakers, like oh, I've never seen speakers that look like that. So he meets Brent, they immediately hit it. And they just became like the best friends right over, you know, over lunch. And Brent calls me and says, I just want to let you know, I'm going to do an interview 
with Sean because once I met him, I was like, I don't even know if I like his speakers, but he's such a cool guy kind of thing. So that, I mean, that's, I mean, just to, to give it on a, put it on a silver plate and give it to you guys, that's what makes high-end audio special. This doesn't happen with, you know, Leica cameras or golf clubs, as I imagine. So, but audio has those kinds of people in it. Well, that's interesting. Um, like if you have a Ferrari, you can't go with five other people and drive in your Ferrari. But if you have a Ferrari stereo system, you can have five people over and they can all enjoy your system. So, mm. I, I, and I, I think that is what, as you've just said, many of us find appealing about this hobby is that we can come together and sort of share it. And it doesn't matter if you have zoo speakers and somebody else has clip speakers and somebody else has magnapans, you can enjoy them all as sounding great, um, even though they all sound completely different, uh, which is what I think everybody is feeling. Everybody who's gone to a show is, is missing now, is the, the ability to gather. So doing a Zoom presentation with you is, um, is really pumping lifeblood back into our system. So we, we appreciate your being here for that. So I have a question for, for all of you. So, there's a fire engine going by. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, do you have, do any of your children, have any of them expressed an interest in, in getting their own systems or, you know, basically becoming audiophiles themselves? Does that happen? No, I have my niece, my nieces had listened to my systems and I tried to play music for them that they were used to listening to. And they were always kind of like, you know, stuck with their heads in their phones. And then one day, one of my nieces was uh, 18 and she called me up and said, have you ever heard headphones? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I've got three pairs of headphones, you know, I've listened to them. She goes, I can't believe how amazing they sound because she'd been used to listening with earbuds. Uh -huh. like, even though she'd been in my home and had heard what I considered to be excellent reproduction of music it wasn't until and and actually that's that's kind of the first my first experience with high fidelity was walking into a stereo store and putting on santana's a practice from a turntable and going oh my god i've got that album all that stuff's in there mm -hmm. so um so from my point of view it's a, it's a hard thing to push somebody into they kind of have to right. just synergistically in their lives be at the point to where they're open to listening right. differently. Take them out of the people. Muzak experience. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I don't have kids, Steve, but I have a good friend whose daughter is in her early 20s and mm -hmm. she's really into jazz LPs from like the 50s and 60s. And okay. I'm helping them put together her first system for them. Oh, and, right. and in fact, they're building an amp camp amp oh. Nelson, <laughs> for her first uh. system. Okay. Wow. And, and, and some of um, uh, um, the speakers from, um, uh, uh, gosh, I can't, GR Research, Danny, Danny's company, GR Research, some Encore speakers, and uh, uh, they're buying some shit components for them. Uh, uh, and she's going to start spinning vinyl uh, uh, around her birthday, which is, which is going to be really exciting. That is, yeah. Oh, I don't actually own a turntable myself, but I bought turntables for both of my kids. And, um, and as far as I know, at least one of them still uses their turntable to listen to records from time to time. And they like, my daughter especially likes the listening to records because it's a little bit more of a sense of occasion than streaming something. So she'll mm. actually sit down and listen to, you know, at least one side of a record where streaming stuff, it's all kind of shuffle play background music. Yeah. So. I, I, people tell me that all the time that are, you know, they just get into it and they notice that they listen, they listen to a whole record rather than one song at a time. Hey, Steve. Yep. Uh, I have a son who, you know, graduated from Stanford with a, with a degree in electrical engineering, number one in his class. Now, he's a wonderful pianist. He loves music and he has a, one of those nine and a half foot D model Steinways in his house. And, um, you think they own a television? No. You think they own an audio system? No. They do not like it. And you know, he's even buddies with all those guys up there at CNET because they all graduated at the same time. Uh -huh. So it was, it's just interesting how, 
to me, a person who grew up around audio, because I've always had an audio system in the house. He right. hates the dumb thing. Yeah. yeah. His, his piano is his audio system. Oh, that, that works. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I still would wonder, but... you know, yeah, I've, I've, I've been to this show before, but I would still wonder why well, wouldn't some wouldn't wouldn't he want to listen to Glenn Gould or something? Yes, he could say my piano sounds better than any recording. I go, yeah, I got that, I'm sure, but don't you want to hear great pianists? You know, so. I but if he's, know, a I if he's a creative, he's a creative type. Time to listen. He's, my son always says he's always working at something. He's okay. the senior engineer for Verizon, you know, and wow, he's, yeah, he's he's got it made, and uh, he works very hard. But to listen to music takes time. Hmm. Well, maybe later. <laughs> so he's not <laughs> an audio file. He's not an audio file. Yeah, he's a yeah, music a rock well, he's a musician. Stuff. Yeah. So out of 59 people, um, basically nobody stepped forward. Steve or uh, David Snyder said his kids have turntables and they do listen to album sides. So by your definition, that might make them audio files. Um, yeah, sure. What's been your experience? with other people that you know in a larger capacity? Um, not much. Yeah. <laughs> well, not much. Uh, I'll, tell you one, I'll tell you one that was really good though. So one of my wife's friends, uh, uh, her daughter um, basically got her father's um, record collection and I got, I got out and I helped her buy a turntable. And she gave me this great line. So she grew up listening to her father's music, right? So she knows it really well. And she said that listening to the LP as opposed to streaming it, she said it was like reading literature in the original language. And I said, bingo, that's great. I'm gonna use that. And I have used that line because she's, since, since it's in her, that music is in her and has heard it that way from LPs for her, even though she was then around 30 years old, hearing it stream, she knew the difference. She knew what it wasn't, that where it was lacking, right? So she, it was already in, in her head as to what music sounds like. So she was open to the idea. It's not like she went on, you know, got, you know, magic with speakers or anything, but she, she knew the difference. And she appreciated the difference. It's interesting. We had Paul McGowan on a while back and this topic came up and he said, you know, the, the young audiophiles are not missing. They haven't gone away. It's that they don't have the money. And when they come of age in their 40s and 50s and they have some disposable income, you will see them come along just as, you know, we're all in our 50s, 60s, 70s, and we've got more expensive systems than we had when we were young so will the people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, when they get older and have disposable income, they will come along and buy the equipment that manufacturers are still making. Is that true? I'm I, 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 I vigorously disagree that that's, that that's the excuse that they don't have right. the money. <laughs> yep. I do not accept that. You know, the, the, uh, the Dyne, the Dyne audio, the um, <laughs> Dayton, Dayton audio, B652 Air speaker, which you can buy on Amazon for $50 a pair. It has a six inch woofer. It's not, it's not a Dyna Audio speaker, but it's $50 a pair. And it's actually very listenable. It has uh, an air motion transformer tweeter, a really tiny one, but it, but it does. And I, and I reviewed it. And then around that same time, I reviewed this this thing from Parts Express called the Leapi, L-E-P-A-I. It's a tiny little integrated amp. It's class H. It costs around $30. So you hook up your phone to that and you have a hi-fi system that's 80 bucks. And you know what? I've listened to it way more than I ever needed to, to write about it or make videos about it. So this excuse that if you're young, you don't have any money, that's why you're not an audiophile or you're not buying nice systems. I do not accept that. I mean, I gave you an extreme example of really, really cheap, but you know, the Dine, the, uh, the Andrew Jones Pioneer speakers, the SPBS 22LR, that speaker is now around a hundred dollars on a hundred dollars a pair on Amazon. It's really good. 
it is really good. So, th I mean, I could go on and I'm not going to, but there's plenty of very, very, very affordable systems. I did a whole video about m many choices for systems that all together were $500 or less. So no, that's not, that's not a valid excuse. Not, yeah, not it really much. comes down to what people are willing to give their time and attention to and exactly. like, focus yeah. on how much they spend and, and, and setting them up, right? You, when you got those $50 speakers, you put them probably on stands that were maybe in order yeah. of magnitude nicer than I can't speakers. help myself. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if you set things up, even if they're inexpensive, if you take the time to set them up carefully and make them sound good, rather than just setting them on the floor, like maybe a lot of other people would do, um, then you can really appreciate them. And that you're absolutely right. It's, it's time and attention and, and a desire to, to take whatever you have, no matter what it costs, or if you got it for free on the side of the road or from your yeah. ankle or whatever. A lot of people get it for free. Sound nicer. You know, one of my neighbors, he found um, a Nakamichi integrated amp and something else on the street. These turned wow. out to be designed by Nelson Pass. Wow, great. And they worked, and they worked fine. <laughs> And he's fat. he's one of these guys. He finds working audio on the street. He he could put together a whole system of stuff that he just found. Hey, uh, he's an artist. He's got a lot of stuff in his in his space, and he regularly finds very free or affordable things. Well, I was encouraged by my nephew who grew of a came of age slightly after Napster, and he was listening on an iPod to earbuds or earphones. But he discovered on his own that MP3s and the like. Are terrible and he wanted to get uncompressed files so that's a step in the right direction anyway absolutely yeah hey steve i wonder if i can uh, take you back to the start of your conversation today uh okay. when you went around and asked the different people uh are you an audiophile mm -hmm. and i'm wondering <clears throat> because of the uh, environment that we're all living in now is the word itself a problem with the yes. file, the file at the end of it. Why? Why people are not admitting that I'm an audiophile. I'm an I'm an audio enthusiast, or I'm a, an audio lover, but I don't want to be a file. You know, because of the overarching connotation or negative connotation mm. it has. I, I yeah. wonder. Do you see what I'm saying? Because if you would have approached me, uh, I might be hesitant to say, uh, "Yes, I'm an audiophile," because. You know, I, I just wanted to throw that out to you. That, no, that that's true. But, you know, over the years, I've asked people to come up with a better word and, and nothing really has come and up. Nobody has. Like audio it. enthusiast or yes. something. But, you know, somehow audiophiles just sticks around. But no, it's not a, it's not a great word, although I don't. Truthfully, I don't understand <laughs> what, what the problem is. No, it's it's more about being a nerd. Right. The, the other thing is that all of you guys know that when people around you don't get it your family might not even get it your friends you know your work uh colleagues they think wow you spent a thousand dollars for speakers that's crazy yeah, right yeah. so everybody's saying what you like is silly or a waste of time or money so i think that's the problem with with good audio with quality audio is that unless you're in it it, it seems absurd to people that's See, why, because they usually say, "I no, no, I would just, I just like music." I, I think Steve, to piggyback up what you just said, is uh, I think a lot of people, and I still get this today, don't think that they can hear what a really good system brings right. to the table in terms of creating an engaging and beguiling experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so they go, oh, "I'm not an audiophile," and then they come over and they listen to my system. And they go, "Like, oh my god, I've never heard anything like that before." Right. It, it, you, you know, it, it's until they have the experience, I, I think that they just don't have some sort of perspective about what it's really sure. about. How, right. how, how could they? Right. That's that's easy. But, you know, when I was in when I was selling the people who said, oh, no, I, I can't hear a difference. And then they did. It was like a breakthrough for them. Right. And then they said, oh, but I can't afford this. And I'd say, well, how much can you afford? And they'd say, oh, you know, $1,000, but that won't be any good. And I'd say, well, let me show you what $1,000 will buy you. And sometimes they, they they got it kind of thing, you know, or sometimes they would say, oh, I can't afford $3,000. I would play them $1,000 and they'd say, well, that's good. But I don't know. I'd say, well, let's 
do fifteen hundred. Basically, we get back to the three thousand dollars sometimes, right? So, um, yeah, the thing that, that they that they can't hear it or appreciate it is always it's always there. But I'm talking about that maybe the reticence to describe yourself as an audiophile to to the world is hard because they view your your passion as uh, ridiculous. Basically, yeah, I could say I gave my uh, younger son my uh, old system. And he, he, he liked the sound. But when I went down to, to see him, the speakers were set up diagonal to each other. Yeah. And, and when I pointed out how much better it had sounded when we placed them properly, he kind of laughed and took, it seems like he took pleasure in not attending to the details. Right? Okay, okay. So yeah. it kind of makes fun of me for doing that. And I think, you know, that, that you're right, that the, uh, it has the appearance of being a little nerdy and, and they try to avoid that. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, they can be nerdy about things that they care about and and do it you know without <laughs> any fear but somehow it's just something about audio that sets people off it in, in you know who aren't in this in a, in a negative way that they put it down i mean i'll tell you a funny one that when i was at cnet in the early 2000s and i was reviewing a lot of home theater in a box systems I get one, you know, was in the lobby of my building. I had a hand truck. I would put like a Sony home theater in a box on the hand truck. I get in the elevator, and one of my, one of the other people would get in the elevator with me. They'd say, they'd see this huge box, right? It would say Sony, a thousand watts, and they'd say, Steve, you have the best job. And I'd say, not not today. <laughs> this isn't this isn't the good stuff. And depending on who was asking, I would tell them, no, you know, this is what I got to do. It's my job, but it's actually really good stuff. No one ever seemed all that interested in, in the follow through of hearing what I thought was good, even though they, they know what I do for a living. It almost never came up. So it's just, and, and, and I was usually the, like, the poorest person that lived in this building. They, most of the people that live here make a lot more money than I do. So it wasn't a money issue. It just was that they weren't interested. Although I will tell you one thing that was amazing to me is that I had a neighbor, he's not here anymore, <clears throat> and he had Wilson whams. You know, you know, you guys know what whams are, right? The original wham, that really gigantic, <laughs> talk about wife acceptance factor, wow. So uh, he had whams with the big 18 inch woofers and, and I thought, wow, what are the chances that in one building there'd be me <laughs> and a guy with whams? So, um, he didn't, they never really worked well in his room. And he had a pretty big room, but they never, I certainly never thought they were coming up to what they could be. That's for sure. I like to, how do you deal with these guys that pull up next to you at a street light and they got their car going thousand watts and, and, and everybody's shaking around there and they think that's the greatest sound in the world. Well, you can't good hear for them. It. It's you can't fine. It. All I feel is just the bump, bump, bump. Well, whatever floats your boat. You know, it's the heartbeat. Your mother's heartbeat when you're, you know, it's, it's reminds them of that. I'd like to um, add um, what was a revelation for me. Uh, not only am I at relatively advanced years pushing 70, I labored for decades under the excuse that because of my congenital hearing loss, I wouldn't be able to hear high frequencies. There's no point in getting a sound system. But it was not till I went to an audio show and listened for myself and I can hear the ambience even with Monroe recordings, that mm. the whole life changed because of COVID, because I had to change time to listen and appreciate stuff. A lot of what's important is not depend on being able to hear high frequencies. There's plenty of phase information and stuff in the mid range that I'm discovering. So, wow, uh, that's fantastic. Wow. I got turned off by that perception and that baggage all their whole life and never listened. Mm. Great. Right. Did you have a that's question for Steve? Yeah. Yeah, hi, Steve. Hi. Um, what do you think about the resurgence of uh, the analog and independent record stores and uh, record store day that they did this year? They split it into three things. And um, a lot of young people seem to really start to embrace the analog side of it and are coming into the industry from that end of it. You know, it's. In, I think this is uh, uh, unexpected that when I'm, there's a store in New York City called In Living Stereo. And the owner of that store is younger than most of the other stores. He's Now he's about 50, but he's had the store since 2001. 
And I noticed that when I hang out in that store, his customers tend to be younger than the, the, than the other stores. And the ratio of his customers that play only vinyl at home, have no digital at home. I've, I've had many conversations that say, oh no, you know, when I'm out, I'm listening on my phone or in my car, I listen to digital. But when, I home, when I'm home, I only play records. And I would say 80% of his customers that are under 50 or under 40, they only play vinyl at home. That's amazing to me. And it may be uh, only, you know, older records that they're buying on Discogs or maybe new music that I'm, you know, not to totally up to speed with, but their, their passion for playing records is really amazing because it's not nostalgic to them. They just find it more interesting. I think that there's, I see this, I see this also, Steve, in, um, in photography because I'm also a photographer. Mm -hmm. and, and kids of that generation, younger adults of that generation also love physical prints, photographic prints, mm -hmm. as well as LPs. And I think there's something, the, the tangibility yeah, of yeah. a photo, a real print or a real LP creates meaning for them in their lives. And, and that's why they they enjoy LPs and, and photographs and things like that. Whereas digital, it's so ephemeral, there's nothing to kind of, in a way, create some sort of, you know, holding on to it in, in terms of your own experience, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, well, I feel that way. I mean, I played records or... that I bought when I was a kid that I still have and enjoy. And when I when I take that record out, it's, it, it, I think about all the things that are attached to that one record, where maybe where I bought it or where I was when I first heard it, those kind of things. And if you, if you came along 50 years, you know, later than me, and you grew up only listening to files, how will you feel when you're 50, 60, 70 years old about music that you never touched? I, do, I don't know how that works. Maybe that doesn't actually matter at all, but it might. And I think for some of the younger generation, they're starting to understand having a physical copy, especially an LP of something that you're gonna hopefully travel with in your life is very valuable. What else What else could people own that is useful to them, not just something they have on a shelf that they look at every now and then, something that they actually use that they bought 50 years ago? Not much, right? <laughs> what else you could, would, would you use that's 50, that you bought 50 years ago? You know, it's like going out and they're trying to sell these veggie hamburgers. I want uh -huh. those. I want a real burger. Uh -huh. It's the same thing. So Steve, yeah. how much do but you... not a 50 year old burger don't don't eat those oh well, well you're right about that <laughs> steve how much do you listen to lps versus digital now and do, what do you use for re both for pleasure and for reviewing uh well you know my the thing about the ratio of of analog to digital is i find that if i'm listening to records you know, in an evening, I'm pretty much only listening to records. I'm not an LP, then I'll listen to a file or something, then I play. No, I only play LPs or I only stream or I only play CDs. I don't mix it up usually. I mean, I might if I was needed to do it for a reason, but normally left to my own devices, I play one format or another. And which um, do you tend to choose in the evening when you're listening? And I would say it veers towards analog but it's i wouldn't say it's it's um it's probably less than 50 percent. it's it's not the majority and do you wh what do you think uh, or do you find that there are generic differences between analog and digital or the differences to me are not just you know the, the technical part of it i think that vinyl when it's working is just more engaging you're more involved in listening and with digital, it's easier to ignore or you find yourself reading a book or something as you're playing digital with analog, you're more likely to be paying attention. That's what it comes down to for me. Steve, this morning I picked up one of those, uh, what do we call it, French, uh, uh, Louise Louer, I can't say it, Louise Louer records, a uh, uh, violin. I decided I want to play it. And, okay. I can see, and it sounded just like a CD to me. Because uh, in the upper frequencies, it was a digital recording, and that comes uh, and it's not a, it was a, it's one of the worst records I have, and this was supposed to be a top 
the line LP. Mm. And, and they digitally record it and it has so much glare in it in the upper frequencies. I actually took it off because I said, I'm just not going to touch this anymore. Yeah, that's too bad. And that, and that album, you know, was not an inexpensive record, but they tried to trick me into thinking it was. Oh, well, that sucks. Can you get your money back, you think? Oh, no, I'm going to do that. You know, it's not worth it. Okay. But it's, you know what I mean? It, it's, just, it's just that I, I, I was shocked that a record label like that would put it on digital and then expect me to think it was a good analog recording. Mm. Which didn't that's come not, close. That's not cool. Yeah, that's not all right. Nope. So uh, have you got a top five list of items that you've reviewed over your long industrious career, which is still going on? Um, like maybe top turntable, top speakers, top amplifier. Yeah, that's a good question. Digital recording. <laughs> Stop recording. Um, well, I mean, I think um, I have to say that the, the, the Clips Cornwalls that I'm using right now, which I've had for less than a year, I, I think these might actually be the ones that stick around longer than average because they just, they, they, they speak to me. They just have this energy to them. And you know, one of the things I think that's interesting about horn speakers is that um, other than classical music, when you hear live music, it's coming, the PA system is horn, or horn speakers. You know, movie theaters are horn speakers. So the, the live music to most people, except for classical, comes through horns. So having a horn speaker at home, it sounds more live. <laughs> You know, I think that's part of what's going on. Uh, as I said earlier, it wouldn't be my only speaker, but I would say I really like horn speakers and there's no, there's only one Klipsch. There's no other company that really makes um, speakers that are equivalents of, of Klipsch's. I mean, JBL is, is the only one, but JBL is um, not as pure. I I uh, I don't quite understand what they're doing a lot of the time, You've but JBL. About... I, I want to listen to more JBL horn speakers. Um, but anyway, so JBL. Uh, I mean, this this clip is is really up there. It's it's funny to say that because it's relatively new to me. Um, but Magna Pants. I definitely have a thing about Magna Pants. I just love the speakers. I love the company. I think it's one of those companies that. It's, it's not expensive enough. It doesn't get enough respect. It's like the Rodney Dangerfield of high-end audio. Mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 their speakers should be twice the price that they are. Have I, have I lost you guys? Are you still there? Steve, have you heard the Volteats? It's, you know, he positions it as a better clip. Yeah, yeah, I've heard them, absolutely. Um, I like them but I haven't spent enough time with him. He was, gonna, he was gonna bring them to me one year and then it just kind of fell through. Um, but yeah, I do like the Volte, especially that really, his, his big one, I forget. Is that called Victoria, I think? That speaker, I've heard it at many shows and it's really, really impressive. He even makes them work in small rooms at shows. So I like, I like that speaker a lot. Um, but I, you know, I own a, um, an SME 15 turntable and uh, I really love this turntable. And I think that beyond that, it sounds good. It just feels good to use it. I owned a VPI classic, an original VPI classic for many years. And I thought it sounded good. And I really like Harry Weisfeld, but I never enjoyed the feel of that turntable. It just kind of, I don't know. It wasn't 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 working for me, and I've owned Lynn LP12s. I've owned three LP12s, and I I really love Lynn's. It's been a long time, but the problem with Lynn's is that I don't think the company <laughs> is really into turntables. They still make them, but they're more interested in selling streamers than they are in selling turntables. So they're they're they they've moved on from the whole thing of analog. And I had a Roxanne for a few years, and I, I like that one a lot. In terms of electronics, I really am a, a fanboy of Nelson Pass. He is the, he is the complete package for me. I, you know, I went to see him about a year ago, and I hung out with him in his his home. And he is such a he's such a character. He's so 
he loves what he does and you know he's 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 arrived at a place where he can just do what he wants he doesn't you know work in the factory he doesn't have to deal with the business aspect of it he just essentially plays and comes up with things and stuff and the fact that he designed so much stuff that he can't build it all he can't sell it all he's got so many ideas that he gives them away you know on the internet for free he's he is he is in that sense a genuine hippie he's not in it to make a lot of money he gives us his stuff away all the time so um just being with him was was amazing i don't know if you any, any of you knew about this thing that he did in the late 70s he made this thing called the ion speaker it was just a one-off thing it was a speaker he told me about it at the time. I, unfortunately, I never heard it, but he said, Steve, I'm gonna make a speaker that has no moving parts. There's no diaphragms to this speaker um, and it can play DC to light. And I said, really, Nelson, you're gonna do that? And he said, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And he did it and he, he brought it to CES. And for some reason I wasn't at that CES. And the one catch to the speaker is it created ozone as it was, it was as it was playing. And he was in the room doing demos for you know a couple of days, and he got really sick because he was basically <laughs> suffocating. So that was the end of that. But he did it just to, just to show that it could be done. Like, can you make a speaker that doesn't have a moving diaphragm? I actually, so, I, I Nelson actually did. Went that. I actually went to that CES show, Steve, and I sat in the room a couple of times listening. Oh yeah listening to that ion speaker. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the, the problem was it was winter, of course, and the room, all the windows were open because it was generating so much heat with this flame right. that was burning right. up. But it right. was an interesting, interesting concept. Yeah, a full range, not like an ion tweeter, but a full range speaker. So yeah, so anyway, I, lo I really love um, him and his passion and his just, just does it and of course the whole the story of shit audio is is right up there i mean that you know it, it's just uh, the shit um shit turned 10 years old earlier this year and i was surprised they didn't make more of a thing about it but when i interviewed jason stoddard about it recently uh when they started that company he and mike moffett they had a lot of advantages over most people that start a company but it was it was hard, hardly a sure thing, and that you know they started making the Asgard amplifier, a Class A fully discrete amplifier, and sell it for two hundred and fifty dollars, made entirely in the U.S. Not entirely, but like 80, 90 percent of it was from U.S. source parts, and um, amazing. And they kept you know coming up with one amazing idea after another, and. Jason Stoddard is an engineer, but he also does all the marketing and he designs that website. And I think it's by far the best audio website in the business because it's it's informative, but it's entertaining. It looks great. The photography is great, answers all your questions. And the prices are incredible. When I do these, these uh, slideshows of having my viewers send in pictures of their systems, shit products are by far the most popular products and there is a way that young people who say oh i can't afford spend no you he makes a DAC for a hundred dollars it's really nice you know so it's an incredible company their one misstep was the turntable but it even seems that the turntable is sort of getting they're getting their act together with the turntable too but the so. problem with the turntable is they aren't mechanical engineers and yeah you, so you that's a, that's a, that was a failing yeah to be successful with your first turntable yeah but i agree with you i've been buying their their products for since they began and i, I love them you know they made a little dsd dac did you ever hear it called the loki the very first loki no, the Loki uh, isn't a DSD, it's the EQ. That's no, an no, EQ. no, the first Loki was actually a DSD only DAC when they were just putting it out to test the waters back in 2009 timeframe. Oh, I don't remember that, but, okay. You know, and it, it it's amazing sounding how good it sounds, right? Mm. I, I'm probably one of the 50 people in the US that bought it, but um, I've got a lot of their products, but I agree with you. I think the reason they're successful is they understood the concept of value proposition. They're very good engineers. And I remember an interview with Mike, like, why are you so successful? He says, we're cheap. You know, it's that simple. We're we make good products and they're cheap. Yeah. And again, 
there isn't another shit. I mean, there are others that are kind of like hi-fi is sort of like it, but not with the range of things. I mean, shit's $100, $129 phono preamp, the Manny. That is amazing how good it is. Moving coil, moving magnet, $129 made in the US. Well, and the, pr the price points are great because you can experiment with different products and being able to do that. And I, I also think one of the challenges in audio is uh, we're almost too serious. We have to make it more fun. Mm. And, if, and I agree your point, just even the name shit, right? Oh, yeah. The notes, we don't take ourselves too seriously and do that. <laughs> uh, it, it's the first place I go to recommend people to buy products is shit. Because if you if ninety nine dollars you don't like it you sell it for seventy nine on eBay, I right? Mean, it, it all works. As soon as that when they arrived at Rocky Mountain the first year, I I was in awe <laughs> that everybody here's how to start a successful company. Everybody is talking about your company. You hear about this company called Shit? What a crazy idea! That's that can't possibly work. Why would you buy something called Shit? So it worked really well. It instantly was the talk of the show so that's hard to do well for him he he, he for, explained in the interview why it was called shit i did i never knew he said that you know as they're moving towards launching the company and at, at that point it didn't have a name he kept saying to his wife oh, i got i got shit to do i got to move this shit where are we going to put all this shit and his wife said why don't you just call it shit and that was it i, so. I thought it was from the old days when we would smoke really good shit yeah, well, that's the beauty of the name is you can apply it in so many ways, right? You can go ape shit over this shit. I mean, it's just, and then of course he wasn't gonna call it S-H-I-T because that was gonna cause a lot of problems. So we came up with this whole thing about how it's spelled and stuff, but just amazing. But the funny, so any other questions? Yeah, the funny thing about our hobby though is, is that it's not like you're buying a single item right. and, 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 and driving it around. Right. We, we're not dealing with, Bugattis or whatever, we're, we're dealing with complex systems that, and then you have the experience of having been a dealer, you know that at, there's an anchor point somewhere. And the anchor point usually is the speaker itself because it's typically the most, it has the greatest deviations in terms of Absolutely. sonic yes. footprint. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how, if you were to get back into the business today, and I know you're not, <laughs> uh, no, how how would you approach and and help people understand sort of where to begin where to, you're on the yellow brick road or about to draw get on there dorothy <laughs> where are you going to put your foot <laughs> well but what you just said i would say and i have I've made a video about this even though there's the old lynn idea about the hierarchy of the system that you start with the source and work your way i think that is sort of works if you know what you're doing but if you do it the other way and start with the speaker, find the speaker, because I, I advise people to try different different speakers and if possible, different types of speakers like magnet pans or electrostatics or open baffle. Listen to as many speakers as you can, however, and then figure out what sound, speaker sound you're looking for and then work backwards from the, the speaker to find, okay, now you figured out you like electrostatic speakers what amplifier is going to work best with that electrostatic speaker, you know, like that. So that's, that's, that's my advice. I think that is by far the most logical way of doing it. I have a question for you, Steve. Okay. Uh, will you consider adding auditions of pieces you're reviewing? Because I noticed my newer MacBook Air has a much improved sound quality. Uh, okay. It, have you thought about that? Oh, doing sound demos? Yeah, doing clips of, mm. of the product that you're reviewing. I am uh, <laughs> very stubborn about not doing that for a number of reasons. So <clears throat> now I have friends that have tried to do it. And the thing is, miking the room to record the sound coming out of speakers is really <laughs> not possible. I mean, people make the mistake of basically putting the microphones or a binaural head in the listening position. And though it seems like it should, that should, that should work, you're, you're too far away from the speakers to do that because you're just getting so much room sound. Now, your ears are not microphones. 
your ears are connected to a computer in your head, a brain. And that ear brain is constantly uh, processing and saying, when you're listening to your system, it's sort of processing out a lot of the room sound that a microphone is picking up and just, there it is, right? So I've never heard anybody do a sound demo where you could actually hear a center image. You just get this very roomy sound. Then there's the question of what the music is, uh, you know, copyright issues. Uh, and if you use music that you had your friend do or something, then no one would know what the music was. You know, I, and I really think if somebody wanted to do this um, as a service, let's put it that way, the way to do it would be is to do it with one speaker if you're doing it with, if you're trying to present speakers, do one speaker, close mic that speaker as much as possible, use the same piece of music for every demo you do. So if you're comparing one speaker to another with the exact same recording played at the same level with more or less the same mic placement because you have to adjust it for each type of speaker, but basically try to control the circumstances as much as possible and then sound demos would be somewhat useful for predicting whether or not you would like the sound of that. I don't think people would actually like that. I think they like the idea of looking at the room and hearing the sound coming out of the speakers and that's it. Now what Michael Fremer has done with doing it for cartridges or turntables or source equipment, that makes more sense, but, but, that, but that's not me. I wouldn't do either ever. I'm more into presenting my ideas and feelings and thoughts about a product than actually presenting that. So there are other people that, that are doing it. I, I really don't need to, but I mean, I understand why you ask, but it's just not me. Okay. It's, so Steve, long, um, it's way too much information I just gave you, but that's it. You've, you've Steve, gone beyond um, your, your scheduled allotted time. So right. Francesca, did you have a quick question before we allow Steve to wrap up? Yeah, Steve, I wanted to know um, your interviews, I think, are really some of the best videos, especially people that Thanks. have been uh, historic in the in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, who do you have planned coming up for 2021? Have you given it any thought? Uh, you mean in terms of people in the business? Uh, no. People in the um, business or people you want to interview. Well, I just did one that I'm going to run on Monday. I interviewed a guy who's maybe, I think he's in his early 30s, and he's a guy who's changed a lot of equipment, it's kind of guy, and he talks about his his journey of starting here and getting this, 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 this. I just did that recently. I'm going to run it on Monday. But in terms of people in the business, I don't really like doing Zoom interviews. I know a lot of people do it, and I wish I, I don't, I don't think I'm good at it. I don't think they look good. So I, I wish I could figure out how to do that better because that way I could interview more, you know, people in, in the business and that would be a good thing. But my, my skills in, in that area are lacking and uh, I'm so busy doing what I do that I don't have enough time to just focus on. I got to figure this, this Zoom recording thing out and make it better. But I'll do them, you know, if, if, if I really, really want to and they want to, I'll, I'll do it anyway, even though they'll look like crap and sound like crap, but I will. But thank you for, for the compliment.